Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at T.S. Eliot's poem The Wasteland and in this section, this lecture, we'll begin with the third section of the poem which is entitled The Fire Sermon. Now uh, it's also about human relationships like last time we saw how uh, the uh, section before this uh, was entirely about the failing human relationships, the failing human uh, communication, the collapse and the crisis of communication and how that spills over into other forms of uh, collapses and other forms of crisis, a crisis in sexual relationships, crisis in intimacy, etc. And also how uh, even human body and human relationships, they get degenerated into waste and trash, right? So the production of waste and trash is something which we see uh, as a recursive phenomenon in the wasteland. The only thing that grows is rubbish. Uh, the only thing that grows is waste. The only thing that grows is deadness. Right, so the only production possible or the only possible production uh, in this particular landscape is the production of waste, the production of deadness, etc. So the very first section we found how the image of the cops planted inside the soil and how that is uh, sort of growing into something, uh, beginning to sprout. Uh, so that image itself was a carrier, was a, was sort of conveyed the fact that you know fertility over here is not about regeneration. Or reproduction doesn't necessarily entail uh, regeneration in wasteland. So, and that's the whole title of the poem. That's the biggest issue uh, in this poem, the biggest theme in the poem: the production and consumption of waste. Now, the third section, the fire sermon, it continues with that production and consumption of waste in terms of how human relationships, sexual relationships, uh, they keep degenerating into things which are uh, essentially mechanistic in quality, essentially trash-like in quality. And also, if you take a look at the, uh, the natural landscape over here, I mean, this actually becomes uh, the entire city, the entire river, River Thames over here, it becomes a reservoir of rubbish. Uh, a reservoir of waste and trash and garbage, right? So garbage, waste, trash, these things are uh, uh, mentioned over and over again, etc. So, you know, if you take a look at the opening section, uh, the fire sermon, and this should be on the screen, where the speaker is saying, the river's tent is broken, the last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed, sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. The river bays, no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, uh, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed, and the friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. Now, it's an excellent example of the combination of the mythic and the contemporary, right? So if you take a look at the markers over here, uh, empty bottles, sandwich paper, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, these are contemporary markers of uh, no, um, entertainment uh, and leisure, uh, etc. Picnic, uh, human picnic, human entertainment, human leisure, etc. So all these activities, all these markers uh, are reflective of certain kinds of activities, right? So testimony of summer nights, uh, human enjoyment. Now, the city doesn't have any of these things anymore which is to say that there's no market, there's no residual marker of human fun, of human happiness left in this particular river. Everything has come to an end. The nymphs have departed. So the nymphs of a river, the nymphs of a sea are traditionally mythical figures of entertainment, mythical figures, uh, the sirens who sing songs, who produce music from water bodies. Uh, you saw that figure, uh, and we saw it in, in the ending of the love song on G. Alfred Prufrock, where there was an image of mermaids singing to the speaker. So again, the mermaids over there, uh, they represented that mythical figure, the mythical music coming out of water bodies. Now, the nymphs are departed. Now, look at the way in which uh, the nymphs are recontextualized in this modern setting. So who are the nymphs? The nymphs are departed and the, and the friends, the loitering heirs of city directors. So the city directors are the London directors, the directors of big companies in the city and the heirs of those companies, um, the heirs of those directors, the children, maybe the sons and uh, the, the daughters, uh, the nymphs are the friends of those people. So again, uh, there's a very uh, 
negative connotation about nymphs over here. So these may be people, these may be women uh, who are mistresses uh, of certain kind of people, privileged people, and they have departed. Right, so the River Thames becomes uh, a body of degeneration over here, a body of garbage, a body of trash, a body of waste over here. And waste, of course, is not just a physical phenomenon in, in, in the wasteland. Waste also becomes an affective phenomenon, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, affective. Affective phenomenon is a mood, uh, it's a certain kind of sentiment, the sentiment of waste, the sentiment of rubbish. Uh, that becomes the, uh, the primary sentiment, the primary effect in this particular poem. Now, uh, if you just go back uh, and, and, and keep reading uh, the, the section, uh, there's a reference again made to uh, Philomel. And if you remember, Philomel was mentioned in the previous section uh, where, again, uh, you know, the whole idea of Philomel being a voiceless woman, a woman whose body has been brutalized uh, sexually, uh, and you know, she becomes the figure of someone who has been uh, victimized and brutalized and rendered agency-less, right? So the agency-lessness of the female figure is something which is represented by the mythical character of Philomel, right? So she represents sexual violence, she represents the, you know, voice lessons, etc. And she becomes a very potent figure uh, in this particular poem as well, because she represents the condition of modernity, the condition of the woman in modernity more, more uh, specifically. And we find in this particular section there is an uh, image of a woman, there's a figure of a woman, a character of a woman, who again is very, very voiceless and whose body again is brutalized and sexually attacked uh, by a male, uh, by a predatory male uh, who just comes and uh, uh, attacks her and uh, you know, causes violence to her sexually and then departs uh, immediately after. So the reference to Philomel and Tiro, or Tiros, uh, uh, Tiro, sorry, the king who violated her is mentioned over here, twit, 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 jog, 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 so rudely forced Tiro. Right, so Philomel was converted into a bird, uh, so this, um, these sounds are onomatopoeic descriptions of bird sounds. So this is, only, this is the only thing that she can speak, she can say, she can communicate uh, through bird sounds, which are obviously ununderstandable. No one can understand what she's saying. And again, this becomes uh, a very important uh, theme in Wasteland, the ununderstandability. So no one can understand what uh, is being said. So what you say, what you articulate is never understood. And this ununderstood condition or the ununderstandability uh, in human voices over here becomes a very important theme in the wasteland. And very quickly, we'll find that soon after this, we'll find the image of Tiresias who will come in. Now, Tiresias uh, is a classical prophet figure. Now, Tiresias is an androgynous figure. He has male as well as female features, right? So his body becomes a, a combination of both features. Uh, and then he is essentially the blind prophet. So he's blind. And also the other thing about Tiresias is no, nothing that he will say will be believed. So he's a prophet, but he's not a powerful prophet. He's someone who can see through situations. He's someone who can, uh, has an intuition, uh, a knowledge of things, so what will come now, what will come after, but he will never be able to make himself understood. And that's a very important uh, phenomenon over here. Okay, so you know you have different figures uh, crisscrossing each other, mythical figures, contemporary figures, uh, topical figures, historical figures, they all come in together to create a sense of uh, degeneration, an effect of degeneration, which is what this poem is all about. Again, we cut back into the image of an unreal city, a cinematic image, a panoramic cinema shot of London, unreal city under the brown fog of a winter noon. So again, the brown fog setting in slowly. Uh, it's like a slow motion camera uh, who's looking at the city, a panoramic city, and the fog becomes uh, obviously a very symbolic presence in the city. It becomes an image of spectrality, it carries an image of uh, claustrophobia, uh, it, it carries an image of non clarity, etc. So, non clarity, spectrality, claustrophobia are all represented uh, in this image of the fog settling in, or the experience of seeing the fog settling in slowly in an unreal city. So, the unreality of London is obviously part of the human disconnect uh, that the inhabitants have over here. No one can connect to anyone else over here. Uh, every connection is superficial, every connection is mechanistic, every connection is uh, degenerative in quality. Right, And that's something which the wasteland keeps uh, hopping on over and over again. Mr. Eugenides, a smiling merchant, unshaven with a pocket full of currants, 
a CF London document site asked me in Demotic French to luncheon at the Canham Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. So again, if we take a look at these images, a lunch at the Canham Street Hotel, uh, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. So a merchant coming and asking someone out for a lunch and a followed by a weekend. So obviously these are indicative of very uh, degenerative sexual activities uh, about human relationships uh, which are uh, very very clandestine in quality, very secretive in quality and obviously very negative in quality the way it is represented. It's a quick lunch at a CD hotel followed by a weekend at the Metropole which is obviously about having um, illicit sex and that is something which keeps coming up again and again in the wasteland. So unshaven, a pocket full of currents. Again, uh, markers of degeneration, markers of unhealthiness. So this is entirely about unhealthiness. There's no health or harmony in the human relationships in the way land. And that spills over into spiritual, sexual, communicative relationships as well. Okay. Uh, and then we have this whole idea of Tiresias coming in uh, as a mythical figure, a mythical prophet. And again, look at the way in which the mythical figure and the machinic figure are combined together. So the mythical and the machinic combined together and to create a very interesting entanglement of confusion and degeneration in the wasteland. And I have an article, I have a published article on this, uh, which I'm happy to upload in the portal, which is entirely about how the humans are mechanized and how the machines are humanized in the wasteland and how that combination, how the transition of humans into machines, uh, mythical figures into mechanistic figures, how that actually underlines uh, the degenerative quality of human relationships in wasteland, which is what this poem is all about. Okay, so at the violet R, when the eyes are eyes and back turn upward from the desk. So again, the eyes on the back are turning upward from the desk at the violet hour, the twilight hour, when the door is coming to an end. That's the only time when the eyes uh, leave the desk, when the back leaves the desk, uh, which is to say, for the entirety of the day, uh, the eyes on the back are stuck to the desk in a very mechanistic kind of existence. So it's not really a productive existence. You're working, but you're not being productive because, you know, the work that you do is alienating you further from any existential, meaningful understanding of life. Right, so this is a classic example of alienation followed by reification, commodification. The human body is converted to commodity and that commodification, the process of commodification is generating the sense of alienation, a loneliness. So this is an example of metropolitan alienation. In a city you feel most alienated, you, in a city you feel, more, you feel most alienated inside a crowd. So the entire idea of the unreal city uh, surrounded by, uh, full of crowds of people who have fogs over them, that becomes an example of alienation, that becomes a very graphic uh, you know, representation of alienation in a, in a metropolis. Okay, so at the violet R, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi, throbbing, waiting. So again, look at the way in which the human engine, the human body is, con is considered or classified, described as an engine, like a taxi, throbbing and waiting. So a taxi waiting for, uh, to, to pick up people is like a throbbing machine. It's something which is waiting, uh, it's not really moving, it's pulsating and it's throbbing. And the human body is described as a similar kind of machine. So again, look at the way in which the human body, uh, the organic body, is described as a mechanistic thing, as a machinic thing, as a machinic entity. So this is what I mean when I just said that the humans are machinized or mechanized in a wasteland, the machines are humanized in a wasteland. So it is an example of dehumanization. I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that strives homeward and brings a sailor home from sea. So again, the figure of Tiresias comes in and if you take a look at the scholarship in Wasteland, we find that Eliot had mentioned that Tiresias is a seeing eye in the poem. So he's the one, he's the one, he's a presence, he's a figure to which the entire activities of Wasteland are focalized. You know the example, the meaning of focalization. So focalization is a camera term, a visual term through which, uh, for instance, a story unfolds through a certain consciousness, through a certain person's eyes. The story is told to you through a certain person's eyes. And that process of mediating the story through a certain person's eyes is called focalization. You're focusing on a particular person and the entire event, the entire activity, all the images are unfolding from that position of perspective, from that perspectival position. So that's an example of focalization. So Tiresias is a focalized figure over here. Whatever happens in Wasteland, this particular poem, whatever images are generated and visualized and represented, take place through the focus of Tiresias. Now obviously there's an irony over here because Tiresias, as we know, physically is a blind prophet. So 
we have a very interesting entanglement over here between blindness and insight. So because he's a prophet, he has insight. He has a special privileged understanding of knowledge, a privileged glimpse, a privileged intuition, a privileged insight into knowledge and life. But also because he's blind, uh, he's physically unable uh, to see it, right? So this is the price he has to pay for insight, blindness. So blindness is a price he has to pay for insight. And of course, he is an androgenous figure, which is to say he's, he's male as well as female. So he's always throbbing between two lives. And again, look at the way in which uh, the mythical figure throbbing between two lives as compared to a taxi throbbing and waiting. So something very banal, something very mundane, something very uh, you know, topical has been compared to something very mythical and mystical. So this combination of the mundane and the mystical, the mundane and the mythical is something which happens uh, throughout the wasteland which makes the poem uh, very, very um, sort of mythic in quality as well as very contemporary in quality. So, you know, Tiresias speaks in a first-person voice over here and he says, I, Tiresias, though blind, uh, I can see at the violet hour, the twilight hour, uh, when the evening, uh, when the sailor comes home from sea. So, what do I see now? I see the typist coming at tea time. So, again, we cut back into London, we cut back into present time, present contemporary London, when the typist comes back home after a hard day's work. The type is home at tea time, clears a breakfast, lights a stove and lays out food and tents. So again, look at the markers, very, very important. So the type is comes home at tea time and it's the only time that she can clear her breakfast, which is to say that she had left home immediately after breakfast and she had departed home and she had been outside all the day. And now she has the time finally to clear her breakfast. And what is she having? She's having food and tents, so tin food, not homemade food not organic food, not something that is homegrown and homemade and healthy. So tin food essentially and symbolically represents uh, unhealthy food, something some which is fast and consumed, uh, almost contaminated and perhaps toxic in quality, something which is preserved artificially, right? And this artificial preservation of food is something which is being hinted at over here in this tin food that she is having. Okay. Out of the window, perilously spread her drying combinations touched by the sun's last ray. So the dying sun is touching her combinations and you know, the, the dresses outside. On the divan are piled at night her bed. Uh, stockings, slippers, camisoles and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled ducks, perceive the scene and foretold the rest. So I can perceive the scene with my wrinkled breast, with my blindness. And because I'm a prophet, I can foretell, I can prophesize what's going to happen and yet I'm an important prophet because I can't articulate. No one was going to believe me and I can't see anything for physical reality, right? I too awaited the expected guest. So we have a guest coming in and again this will be an example of a very unhealthy and degenerative sexual relationship, something which has been hinted at even before at the example of this uh, Mr. Eugenitz coming in and asking uh, a human figure, presumably the speaker, to have lunch with him at the Cannon Street Hotel, a very seedy hotel, and then disappear uh, for a weekend at a Metropole to have amorous activities which are clandestine in quality, right? Not healthy or you know, life-giving in quality. Okay, so the uh, expected guest is coming and we are about to see again an example of a very decadent sexual uh, activity, a very decadent sexual scene. He, the young carbuncular, young man carbuncular arrives. So carbuncular, he's got a lot of carbuncles, which is to say he's got a skin problem. He's got a situation on the skin which is unhealthy in quality. It can help come out of indigestion, it can come out of a loss of appetite, it can emerge out of all kinds of different things. But it's a symptom of unhealthiness, it's a symptom of degeneration, this carbuncular condition of the uh, young man. He, the young man carbuncular arrives, a small house agent's clerk. So who is he? He's a house agent's clerk. So we have a typist, we have a clerk, uh, and they represent uh, the modernity over here. They represent the modern man and the modern female uh, in this met metropolis, right? So the female is a clerk, uh, the female is a typist, sorry, and the man is a clerk, and they come together to have some very quick sex, essentially, after which he'll disappear. A small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the law on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. So he's someone who carries the legal voice of insurance, assurance, etc. So he's a clerk. The, the time is not prepared uh, and as he guesses, the meal is ended. She is bored and tired and devious to engage her in caresses which, are still, which still are unproved, unreproved if undesired, flushed and undecided. Flush and decided, he assaults at once, exploring hands and counter no defense. His vanity requires no response. So again, look at the 
passive performance of sex over here. So she, he assaults her. The word assault is important. It's an ex example of sexual violence. And we come back to the image of uh, Philomel over here, the woman, the archetypal female figure who is violated by the man, uh, by the powerful man, by the privileged man. And she is helpless against this male sexual violence, this predatory male sexual violence, which is something that is replayed in modern times in the image of the typist whose body has been attacked by the clerk. And it's actually a very decadent and sad scene where the entire activity of sex has been described as a very mechanistic thing uh, without any consent, uh, you know, and this is just an attack and it's undesired uh, and it just goes on as a passive thing, which is a very uh, dark reflection of modernity, a very dark reflection of modern human relationships, of modern human intimacy, where there's a complete crisis in communication, there's no reciprocity, there's no dialogic quality and it's just an assault on the female body. Uh, a very quick assault, a very quick gratification after which it leaves, right? And that's how the whole entire scene is played out over here. Uh, his vanity requires no response. So my published article in Wasteland uh, has a title, Exploring Hands Encounter No Defense. If you Google me up and you write this line, Exploring Hands Encounter No Defense, it will show up. It was published in a, a journal called Peer English, uh, which is brought up by Leicester University, UK. And I, I'm, I'm happy to upload it in a portal if you wish to read it, uh, which gives a very uh, which deals with this particular scene essentially and it talks about how human relationships, how human sexual relationships uh, degenerate in wasteland to the, to the extent that everything becomes a machinic engagement. It's like a typewriter and a pen coming together. So the typist is essentially the typewriter uh, and the clerk over here is just someone who is carrying out a, a very quick assault uh, on the female body and after which he leaves. Okay. Uh, and I, Tiresias, have full suffered all, enacted on the same divan or bed. I, who have sat by the thieves below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, uh, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. Again, uh, the verbs are very interesting. Assault, grope, all these verbs are examples of you know, predatory sexual behavior or sexual violence, right? So, which, are, which don't necessarily have consent uh, and very, very dark, sinister activities. Uh, and also look at the way in which Tiresias, who had been, uh, who had seen hell, who had seen the mythical quality of hell, the mythical landscape of hell, now finds himself situated in this modern urban setting, modern urban decadent setting, and he can see everything together. For him, time is one continuum. Uh, this mythical time, historical time, and contemporary time. So every time, all the different dimensions of time come together in Tiresias, and you know he who had said by the Thebes, uh, and now. I'm sitting in, in London in this uh, little apartment, this very decadent, claustrophobic apartment, and I'm seeing uh, this very quick sex or sexual activity which doesn't have any love, doesn't have any intimacy, and obviously reflects the degeneration of human relationships at, at a very, very dark, sinister level. And if you come back and see the uh, aftermath of this activity, what happens as a fallout of this activity and that becomes even darker in quality. And this is the, she come, you know, the, the focus comes back on the woman over here. She turns and looks a moment uh, in the glass. The, the lover is gone. He had, he had groped his way down the stairs. Again, the word grope is a classic uh, verb for predatory sexual activity, just like assault is. And before that, uh, there was a patronizing kiss. Uh, you know, there's no love. There's a complete act of lovelessness which has been described over here. And after it goes away, what happens to her? She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of a departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Again, very, very important. The passivity is very, very important. The inertia is very, very important. And if you remember, if you go back to the preludes, the one that we did, the image of the uh, quote-unquote fallen woman uh, who had just suddenly had this glimpse of a life as an epiphanic moment, uh, flickering on the screen like a cinema image. Prior to that and even after that, everything is very, very passive. Her body is very, very passive. Her awareness of her own body is very, very passive because she is constantly trampled by insistent feet, if you remember the lines from Preludes. And the act of being trampled upon, you know, obviously it means that you become a reservoir and receiver of violence uh, at a very bodily level. And that numbs you essentially. So if you constantly get more and more violence you know, given to your body and you 
if you internalize violence as a woman, a time comes when everything becomes half-formed, when your brain is unable to create a fully formed thought, everything becomes a half-formed thought. And she allows, her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Again, look at these very machinic metaphors over here. It's not a mind, it's a brain. Okay, and there's a very big difference, as you know. The brain is this neural organism, this neural machine, uh, or just rather this neural net of combinations, electrochemical combinations, and that allows one half-formed thought to pass. It's like an electric circuit allowing a signal to pass. It's the same thing, the same metaphor, the same rhetoric is being used over here to describe the human mind, which has been described as a neural net, which is allowing a half-formed electrochemical reaction to pass. Okay, it's that, it's that mechanistic in quality. Okay. And hardly aware of a departed lover, this half awareness, this half formed thought, is, and obviously these become reflections of a numbed existence, a numbed modernity in the metropolis, right? So again, we go back to uh, George Simmel's uh, uh, seminal work on the metropolis and mental life, where he talked about the, uh, the modern condition of modernity as a neurotic condition, as an example of neurosis, okay? And that's something which you find over here as well. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about the room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on a gramophone. Again, automatic hand is very, very important. The mechanistic movement, the mechanistic motor movement is very, very important. Even the motor movement is automatic in quality. Even the motor movement is mechanized in quality, right? And this mechanization of motor movement is a reflection of the numbness of modernity, right? So this is a numbed human condition where you don't really have any feeling. So the entire sense ancient uh, human quality is being numbed away and all you can have is half form uh, thoughts and half awarenesses and automatically motor movements uh, maneuvering with what is around you, right? So this is like a motor maneuver which is quite automatic in quality and that's, that, that automatism is an important thing over here. <laughs> and this is what I mean when I say the human body, the human motor movement, the human limbs, the human awareness, the human consciousness, everything is converted into a mechanistic existence by this metropolis. Okay, so, um, and then we come back to the end uh, of this uh, poem, uh, this particular section, where the reference to Carthage, to Carthage then I come, burning, 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 O oh Lord, the pluck is me out, O oh Lord, the pluck is burning. So the reference over here is St. Augustine, uh, St. Augustine's uh, Confessions, which is his collection of his uh, writings. Uh, now, the whole idea of burning away is an example of purgation, uh, which connects to the uh, title of this particular section, uh, Fire Sermon, which is essentially a, a message from the Buddha, uh, Gautam Buddha, uh, which is essentially about how to control bodily desires, how to control your sexual desires, uh, and how to you know, sublimate your sexual desires into something more uh, substantial, something more mystical, something more spiritual. And this connection between Buddha and St. Augustine is important over here because you know, we, we, we're looking at two different dimensions of philosophy. One, Eastern philosophy represented by Buddha, and we have Western philosophy represented by St. Augustine. And the connection over here is very, very important because in a wasteland, by the time the poem ends, you find that the poem ends with a reference to the Gita, uh, the Upanishad, the Gita, where there's a reference to Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. That is what uh, the speaker says in the end. So this entire gaze towards Eastern philosophy is important, where you know we're looking at the way in which bodily desire, sexual desire, is can be converted, can be sublimated into something more uh, redemptive in quality. So this whole idea of burning, 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 burning is a reference to purgation, a reference to the burning flesh, which is essentially about the uh, degenerative sexual desire, which is getting burnt. Away. And then we move towards the Lord, away uh, towards a spiritual existence, which can sublimate you uh, into a better existential level. And this reference to uh, 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 Saint Augustine is important because you know if you look at the historical uh, Saint Augustine, I mean he moved like Buddha, for instance, he moved into spirituality uh, after an experience, after an entire life of lust, after an entire life of earthly pleasures. And only after he was exhausted of all lively pleasures, exhausted of all lusty pleasures, he moved into spirituality, just like Buddha did. So Gautam Buddha, if you remember, he was a prince uh, you know, when he was born, 
and he grew up in his entire life of lust and luxury and all kinds of earthly pleasures and only after he grew exhausted of it he got enlightenment to move away from that earthly pleasure into something more spiritual something more sustainable right so the entire movement from sexuality to spirituality is something which is represented over here through two different uh, historical and mythical not mythical philosophical figures right so one the eastern philosophical figure of Gautam Buddha and the western one of St. Augustine and again what the poem does over here it makes a combination of two different schools of philosophy both aiming to do the same thing the movement away from sexuality into spirituality which is what the voice is all about so burning over here becomes an example an experience of purgation and only through purgation can reach elevation can reach uh, the example of a, a state of spirituality so if you take a look at the Dantesque model of uh, divine comedy so inferno followed by purgatorio and in the end you reach paradiso right so the Italian uh, um, uh, words for you know, inferno purgatorio paradiso you can only reach paradise only after you go through purgation of the entire uh, experience of burning away your sins burning away your fleshly desires burning away your earthly desires only after you burn away everything can you reach the paradisal condition of the paradiso and Dante's divine comedy right so we have a similar kind of experience of purgation described to way so this concludes the third section of Wasteland of Fire Sermon. We move on to the next section, the next lecture. We just go through it again and connect it to the entire poem. For instance, the Battle of the Dead, and then followed by the second section and the third section. We find it's a continuum across the entire poem, which makes it such a moving poem. It's one of the greatest poems written in modern times, and it's one of the uh, most articulate voices of modernity. Western European modernity and the decadence of modernity uh, as a spiritual condition is something which Eliot's poem uh, depicts very graphically and very uh, compellingly. So I'll see you uh, the next section uh, with the next section, the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.